All integers are are whole numbers that either have a positive or negative value. So anything that has a decimal or a fraction is not an integer because it's not a whole number. Uh, and the way it works, every number but zero falls into either positive or negative territory. Think of zero as Switzerland. It doesn't take a side. It's in between. So down here to the left of a zero is negative value. To the right is positive. And when you're moving along a number line, anytime you move to the left, you have a decreasing value. Okay. And so because of that, if you are at a two and you move, or negative two, and you move down to a negative eight, because you have moved to the left, the negative eight is actually worth less than the negative two, which can be a little confusing because we're used to the larger digits being worth more. But when it comes to the negatives, if you want to put it in practical terms, you can think of this as money you owe. Would you rather pay $8 for something or $2 for something? $2 is more desirable, so it has a greater value to me. Um, then whenever I'm on the number line and I happen to move to the right, these are increasing values, okay? Um, just like, you know, the negative eight, negative two, negative two is to the right. So it is a greater value. And no matter what it is, a positive, anything to the right of the zero is always, always worth more than a negative. So if you are comparing integers, um, and you're deciding, well, which one's greater? If something is positive, it doesn't matter what size it is. It's always going to be greater than a negative number. Then within this, we also have something called absolute values. And absolute values don't care about above or below. They care about distance away from this neutral point. So if we have a negative six, but it is in these bars, the straight bars, no little tabs on the end, this is representing absolute value. And again, all absolute value means is distance away from zero. It doesn't care if we've moved six to the right or six to the left, it's how many places. So the absolute values always evaluate to a positive number. And when we're trying to describe what it means in terms of everyday life, we talk about distance away from zero. So uh, if you're dealing with temperatures, it would be distance away from the freezing point. If you're talking about elevation, it's distance away from sea level. Uh, and again, not caring, we don't specify above or below, we just care about away. The only time an absolute value would be negative is if there is a negative sign in front of it. Because whenever we are dealing with a negative sign in front of something, even if we treated this as parentheses, if I evaluated negative three, what's the absolute value of negative three? Oh, it's three places away from zero, but then because I have the negative on front of that, I have to tack that negative in front of here. And so then I have what's the opposite of positive three? It is a negative three. The absolute value of two is two, but then it asks me to find the opposite of that. The opposite of two is negative two. So the only time an absolute value would turn into a negative integer is if you had a negative sign in front of it. So now we also have decimals involved. Now these aren't official integers because they're gonna represent less than a whole. Both fractions, decimals, and percents are ways of expressing less than a whole amount. And there's a format that they follow. We have our decimal. Anything to the left of the decimal is a whole number. Anything to the right is less than a whole, so decimal. And well, I realize I just took up my writing space. And so we care about place values. The place value right next to the decimal is called the tenths, okay? Anything that is a decimal value ends in THS. This lets us distinguish it from the whole number tens. There are no ones though uh, in these, okay? So after the tenths would be hundredths. 
got the THS. Then we have thousands and ten thousands. Okay. So other than there being no one place, everything is basically a mirror image of the whole numbers. So we could have hundred thousandths, millionths, ten millionths, which always just makes me thankfully nobody's nearby and they can't have the projectile spit going on. Um, so the reason we start with the tens is because if we were dealing with money and I had you know five dollars and thirty cents. Well, that's not three months. Any number in there is worth a dime, and a dime is worth 10. So it would be 30, okay? Because there are three tens in a hundred, which makes up the full dollar, right? Then if we had, um, just go, I don't know why I picked a five again. I'm just not being very creative. Uh, there. So this four is worth hundredths. Because if we think of this in terms of money, this four represents four pennies. Well, how much is four pennies of a dollar? It's four cents out of a hundred cents. So it's four hundredths. Then we have thousands, ten thousands, and so on. We're really, other than your uh, potentially in homework problems, we're not really going to concern ourselves with much below four decimal places. Generally, we're dealing with the first three and call that good enough because it gives us close enough to the value we're interested in knowing and we don't need to be so exactly precise. So how do we say some of these things? Well, if I have a, a number and I have a point nine, we identify that as the digit it is. And we label it then by the place value it sits in. The place value right next to the zero or the decimal is a tenth. So this is nine tenths. The other really cool thing is decimals can also turn into fractions. Really easy to do. We take that nine, and then if it is nine tenths, that means it's nine out of ten. So we just put it over its place value. So 0 0.9, nine tenths, nine over ten all representing the exact same amount. If I have zero, um, three, this is the digit three, in which location? Two spaces over. So we call it by whatever the farthest over space is, two spaces over is the hundredths. Hundredths. And again, to turn this into a fraction, we just take the digit and we put it over its place value. We could then verify we did that, right? Because if we take three and we divide it by 100, it's going to take us back to this, but we haven't got there yet. It's okay. If I have two point um, four, when I have a whole number and less than a whole, the decimal, we denote the decimal by using the word and. So we would say two and, then we identify the digit and its place value. Two and four tenths, and to turn that into a fraction, we just convert it to a mixed number. Two is a whole amount. We don't, we don't mess with that. We just make it a two. Then we have four tenths, four out of 10. There's a mixed number. So uh, we can convert one to the other in this simple manner. All right, can you please give me what your definition of absolute value is? The distance a number is from zero, it's the positive. You bet, the distance a number is from zero and it always evaluates to a positive value. Lovely. So that would be something that looked like the negative three with the absolute value bars, then is equal to a positive three because it's three places away from zero. Okay, does somebody have a definition for inequality? Not in the social justice, justice sense, but in the mathematical sense. You said that there was a raised hand feature? There is, down at the bottom where there's the smiley face where it says reactions. 
Um, how do I access that? You should just be able to click on it and then like a clap symbol, a thumbs up, celebration, and at the bottom it should be like a raised hand. There we go. Okay. Uh, Emily. Um, for inequality, isn't it um, when, uh, I can't think of like the words, but it's like, if I said uh, like two is bigger than one, or the little like carrots? Yeah, that. Yeah, it's like a carrot knocked over on its side. You bet. So this is the inequality symbol and it's a way of comparing the value, comparing two numbers to one another. So whenever the first number is larger, then we have the open end of the inequality sign facing it. And this is saying greater than. Two is greater than one. Um, if we have that in reverse, a negative two and a four, negative two is less than four. So all it is is a way of expressing, comparing uh, two numbers. And if you're ever not sure, we always have the little alligator mouth. Alligator wants to eat the bigger number, so have the open jaws facing it. Okay, how about the solution to an inequality? I see that you're ready with this. Anybody? I want to I want to share the love. Anybody else? Do you prefer to go by Emmy? That's the the name I see. Uh, it's either one. This is just what I had for another class, so I just left it. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you would please tell me what a solution to an inequality is. Um. So it's uh what I got uh when I looked it up was um going with the two is bigger than one, if the one was an X, uh, one would be the, the solution to make it true. You bet, great. It's, it's what the potential values of X to make the inequality statement true. So if we have two is greater than the X value, we need X to be um, anything less than two, right? So that would be X could be one. X could be negative 10, X could be negative a million, X could be zero, doesn't matter. It just has to be X, it has a value less than two in order to keep this accurate, okay? Um, and there are times when we have to be, be careful because sometimes if one of the numbers is negative and we're comparing it, what does that actually you know, mean as far as the sign? So yeah, it's just finding what our range of values are. And so because in this case, we're used to solving for the X and saying X equals this amount. When it comes to inequalities, X doesn't have to be limited to just one value. It can be anything that falls beneath this quantity. So it's, it's unlimited. It's just anywhere uh, to the left on the number line of a two. Okay, um, so what does the 10th mean? Alex. The tenth is the um, is the first place behind the decimal point. You bet. So it is the number directly behind the decimal point. And what is this representing? Out of what? Out of ten. Two out of ten. It is. Um, or it's, I guess, in a way, if if it was just a one, it is representing one tenth of a whole. So yeah, it's, it's a tenth of a whole value, okay? You How about- also simplify it. You could also simplify it into one fifth. In this case, you could, you could. Um, but in the case of one tenth, you would not be able to simplify it any further. So it's best to leave it as a tenth. Yeah, yeah, and, and we could, but uh, if we weren't being asked to simplify, we're just trying to find out like, what is this representing? It's representing that we have two parts out of 10. Um, so yeah, okay. Uh, Mike, do you have a definition for hundredth? Yeah, it's the second digit to the right of a decimal. You bet, and how much is its worth, its number worth? Hundredths. One hundredths of a whole. So yes, it is that or one one hundredth of a whole. We'll go ahead and just keep using one, okay? 
All right. Um, just to make this quicker, guess what thousandths is? <laughs> it's three places over, and it's worth one one thousandths of a whole number. Okay. So this would be like taking a penny and breaking a penny into smaller pieces. That's what that is. And then the ten thousandths is four places over, representing one ten thousandths of a whole. This is like me, 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 microscopic. Okay. Can anybody explaining base 10 can be a little confusing. Can you give me a description of what it would look like physically if your explanation of it is a little tough? Tanner, go for it. Um, it's essentially any integer in our, um, like any number you would see, such as like, um, if it was 45, um, four would be in the tens place, five would be in the ones place, and then anything after the decimal as well. It's basically just the number system we use. You bet. Um, so oftentimes, uh, especially in adding and subtracting or whatever and expressing less than a whole amount, the base 10 can be a really great way to do that. So if we had something like a block here and we broke this up into 10 columns, I don't even know where I'm at. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten columns with ten rows. Ten columns of ten rows. In here would be a hundred squares. Having one hundred squares. If again, we think in terms of money, it takes a hundred pennies to make a hole. This would represent one hole. So if I just took one of those columns away, we'll pretend there's 10 now, I don't even know. This would be representing one tenth. Okay, and then if I had to break this up further and further, we can use different diagrams or we could have this even be worth a tenth and breaking that tenth into tenths. And so everything can break down into smaller and smaller pieces, um, but it's then a way of being able to find out how much you have. So if you had, you know, something like four tenths plus two tenths, you would have four of these, and then you'd add two more to get a total of six tens, but it still would only be one, two, three, four, five, six out of the 100 pieces it takes to make a whole. So base tens, again, are just a physical way of being able to represent less than whole amounts, to be able to combine them, simplify them, and whatnot to find out how much you actually have. Sum. What's sum? Joe. The answer to an addition problem. Perfect. Yes. Whenever you see the word sum, it means you are adding some values together. OK. Can somebody tell me what the definition of difference is? Uh, looks like Jason jumped on that one. What's difference mean? It's the uh, answer and subtraction problem. Answer in a subtraction problem. How about quotient? And Alex, you had your hand raised. So Alex, what is a quotient? A quotient, I believe, is the, is the product of a division problem. It's the answer in a division problem. So we don't want to use the word product. Because product would be a multiplication. You got it. You got it. So uh, that also answers our next one. What does product mean? It means the answer in a multiplication problem. And quotient is the answer in a division problem. OK, what 
is an exponent. So for those of you who had their hand, so Joe, you still have your hand up. If you if you want to answer, great. Otherwise, hit that raise a hand feature again, and then it'll go down. Okay. Let's hear. Let's hear from somebody else. What is an exponent? Mike. A quantity representing the power to which a given number or expression is to be raised. Okay. Could you hear that? Sorry. You have like an everyday, just a, a chill, not quite so technical explanation. Like when have you seen exponents and what are you doing when you see them? Um, yeah, I'm a little lost now, sorry. <laughs> You don't quite remember? No, I was out of my head at the time. Moment. Hey, no problem. It's, it's pressure when I call on mm -hmm. you. Um, can uh, Dan, can you explain? So, Mike, you had a, a, a great definition. I just seeing if we have another way we can phrase this. So, Dan, can you explain to me an exponent? you're talking you're on mute my unmute button didn't work oh there we go a symbol written above and to the right to indicate the operation of raising to a power okay well what does raising so yes yeah, so it's so if i have a number and it's a number raised up and to the right what does it what does a power mean what am i doing you're multiplying it we're multiplying that number by itself, however times that exponent tells me to. So if we have, so the, the simplest explanation is what is an exponent? It simplifies repeated multiplication. Multiplication's purpose is to simplify repeated addition. Exponent's purpose is to simplify repeated multiplication. So if I had a two to the fifth power, that means I have a two times a two times a two times a two times a two. The only number that exists is my base. And I write it out as many times as that exponent tells me it exists. It says it exists five times. So then when I'm trying to then evaluate that, I just start chunking it together. Four times or two times two is four, two times two is four times two, and all of these numbers are getting multiplied together. I'm going to take a more easy route by going four times two to get eight times four and say, oh, that is 32. So five, two to the fifth evaluates to 32. While we're learning that, we want to make sure that we are writing out that repeated multiplication because so often our brains jump to our comfort zone, which is multiplication and saying two times a five. I don't have that because two times a five means I have a two plus two plus two plus two plus two, plus two to just get 10. When we have exponents, things are growing dramatically they're expanding upon one another so um that's why taking this route to get to the answer is good you can always double check it on a calculator using the x to the y button on your uh scientific calculator you would type in a two say level two x to the y and then a five your calculator will read that as find out what two to the fifth power equals. And then scientific notation. We're not sure how to define it. What would it look like? Tanner? Um, it's basically just a form of expressing numbers. One example I just found off of uh, Google Images was just rewriting um, like 45,000 could be uh, simplified into 4.5 times 10 to the fourth power. So scientific notation is just a way of letting us express very large or very small numbers in kind of a condensed form. 
And all we're doing in this is moving the decimal point. The rule is we have something like A times, or you can have the X, 10 to some exponential value. And A has to fall in between one and 10. So it has to be one or greater or less than 10. So it can only be a one digit number. When I'm looking at something like 45, I'll write it out here. So 45,000, I need, instead of something this big, I need my leading number to be greater than one, less than 10. Well, four as a one digit whole number would work. So I start the decimals back here and I move it one, two, three, four places to put it here. So now we have a 4.5. Five. So anything after that five, uh, after that decimal point, just turned into a decimal value. Then I say I multiply that by ten, and I move the decimal four places. There we go. So just to say, I took away four decimal places to get to this leading value, and then if I multiplied them back in, I would get back to this original value. But sometimes when we are dealing with uh, something just huge, and it's a uh, to something this large. I don't want to have to write all of that out every time I need to reference it. So what I can do is I can basically make a shorthand of it by just Moving the decimal over, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. This, so now I can have two as a leading number. And how many place values can get added back to that? 12 place values if I expanded it back out to its original notation. But look at how short this is. This and this are equivalent. The other thing is we can express very, very small numbers in scientific notation. So if I have 0 0.0000071, 0 0 0 0 okay, I need to move the decimal back to get a one digit whole number and anything after that. So I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. By moving it eight places back, I then can make it a 7.1 times 10. Now, we're going we're gonna to get to learn a little bit more about this. We moved it back eight places. So we, whenever we have a value that is originally as a decimal point, very small, we put a negative on the exponent to represent less than a whole when it gets multiplied back out. So instead of having all of these, I can write it as 7.1 times 10 to the negative eight. So whenever we have a value, if we have, normally we have ways of creating larger values or smaller values. And oftentimes it's always, it's, it's gonna be based on units of 10. So if you have 10 $1 bills, you can, instead of having 10 individual bills, you can condense that into one $10 bill. Well, the same thing applies with decimal values. If you have pennies, if you have 10 pennies and every penny is worth one hundredth of a dollar, but you get that 10 times, that then simplifies to one dime. So these two, if we have 10 of those, are equivalent. So whenever we have a lot of a small value, we can condense it into uh, larger or units that are worth more and then just be making it easier on yourself. Additionally, when we get into adding and subtracting fractions, sometimes we have a larger value that is too big that we got to break it apart into its equivalent smaller values so that then we can take away pieces of it. So if I had two tenths, what is that worth? Well, each tenth is made up of 10 
hundreds. And hundreds. Oftentimes we can, um, in some of the homework, it might give you different visuals. So this rectangle might be worth one tenth or 0 0.1. And then we could have these little squares be one hundredth and be 0 0.01. And this is kind of where that base 10 comes into play. When we had the whole column, this was worth a tenth and it was made up of 10 of these little squares with each of those squares being a hundredth, okay? Um, we could even then break this hundredth down and we'll, we could use a bar to represent it. So one thousandth, for 0 0.001 and dots for 10 thousandths. Okay, so because you can put 10 dots together and make it make this line. You can stack 10 lines on top of each other and have it equal um, a hundredth. You can then stack 10 hundredths next together and have one tenth. You can stack 10 tenths together and get one whole big box. So it's just having this base 10 idea to be able to understand how we break apart or combine things to simplify them. The 10 of each of the lower values is equivalent to one of the larger values. So if we are looking at the unit two changing values activity, it's saying here's a rectangle. So it's one of the long rectangles made up of a lot of individual 10 individual boxes. So how much does each little square represent? So uh, I'll actually write it out here. So if I have this, this go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. So if this is worth, uh, what number does the rectangle re represent if each small square represents one? So if each one of these is worth one, no decimal, what is this whole rectangle worth? You can go ahead and type it in the chat and hit enter. Okay, so Tim says 10, anybody else? Dan, Lisa, Jason, great. Okay, yes, 10 ones equals one tenth. Okay. All right, so how much do you have then if each one of these squares represents one tenth? Type it into the chat, hit enter. One whole. And 10 tenths simplifies to one whole. Mm -hmm. Okay. How much do you have if each one of these is represented, if each box is represented by a hundredth? 0 0.01. So one tenth, one tenth. How about if each little box is worth 1,000? That you, the, okay. Okay. So if, if each one of these represents A thousandths, it then the whole rectangle can't also then also rep represent a thousandths. Because what we have here, yes, it's going to be a hundredth. Because if I have 0 0.001, 0 0.001, 0 0.001, and so on and so forth, 10 times, all of those ones add up to 10. So when I carry, it then leaves me with 0 0.010 
this zero holds no value, so I can drop it. So 10 of a small unit is equivalent to one of a larger unit. Okay. And uh, if I have 10 of these bars, no individual boxes within them, if I have 10 bars, I have no idea. Pretend there's 10 there. Um, how much do I have if each rectangle represents 10? Okay. So if each one of these is worth 10, how much do we have all together? 100. Yep, going to be worth 100. What if each one of these represents a tenth, one tenth? How much do we have? It would be one whole because 10 dimes equals $1. Okay, now I only showed you four decimal places, but as I said, it continues on. So if each one of these represented point, let's see if we got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five numbers over, each one of those is worth that, what is the whole square gonna be? That is a hundred thousand. Yeah, well, this is each one is worth a hundred thousand. So, yeah, what are 10 of them worth? Uh, a, a, a ten thousand. So, Dan says ten thousand. Anybody else think ten thousand or? One ten thousand, yep. One ten thousand, yeah. We basically, when we have ten of something, we take one of its, we move one of its decimal places over to make it worth more. So, okay, wunderbar. That's that in a nutshell. I will make sure to get you all added for that as well to the great book. Let's see what we have next. Alex, did you have a question? your hand is raised. So if you don't, you can go ahead and go back down to that where and click on, there we go, you got it. I forgot that it was raised. It's okay. Oh, there is, so there's a block 10 simulator that's optional, but I think you have to have like gizmos and you can get a free log. I, I have it in there. It's, it's like the idea of it is good, but the actual, actual execution of it is a little annoying. Okay, Ooh. so we're basically, you know how I had those different tenths, these different values and the different shapes. We're gonna find different ways to represent them using squares and rectangles. So the U2 squares and rectangle. Um, oh, I don't have this as a quiz. I have it as a handout, okay. So hopefully you are all able to access that handout. I will write the shapes up here again to make it so if we have big block, big square, this is one whole, uh, the long rectangle is gonna be a 10th, an individual square, is going to be worth a hundredth, a bar is going to be worth a thousandth, and a dot is going to be worth ten thousandths. So this is your the way that you could physically represent this. Um, instead of having to like draw anything out, we can just call this um, 
So a large square, a rectangle, a small square, um, uh, see, we'll call this a B for a bar and a D for a dot. So you can be like 10 L or um, 7 S for seven boxes so that you don't actually have to draw them out if that helps. Okay. So question number one shows a diagram with one, two, three, four, five, 13 boxes. So we have 13 squares, small squares. What is another diagram that we could draw to represent this exact same amount, but not just using exclusively squares? So 13, 13 S. So what else would be equivalent to 13 S or 13 hundredths squares? Okay, two, two and a half what? Reading the, the chat, two and a half rectangles. Well, we can't just have like a chunk of a rectangle. Also, if I have 13 little squares, it takes 10 of these guys to equal one of these guys, right? So it is 0.13, we, we need it with diagrams though. If I have 13 little squares, what can I do with some of those little squares to represent them differently? Four, six, eight, 10, 11, 12, 13. What is equal to 10 little squares? Wait, so if we're going by tens, does that mean that the uh, that that the total amount is is out of 10? No, we have 13. We have 13 of these little hundredth squares. Oh, of the hundredth squares. Okay, so there were the hundredths. How else can I sit how how could I simplify all of this? Is there another way I can express this exact same amount? It'd be 13 over 100. Not as a fraction, using these shapes. Hmm. Okay, looks like we're, okay. There we go, we can trade 10 squares for one rectangle because 10 of the lower value equals one of the value above it. So I could have, one large rectangle, which accounts for 10 of those, but then I still have three squares that go with it because those couldn't be combined evenly. So one rectangle and three little squares represents the exact same amount as 13 of the squares we've just simplified. Okay, does that make a little more sense? So we want to keep doing this and expressing how we can either combine 10 of something to make a larger unit or break something into 10 of its lower value equivalents. Okay. So if somebody drew two squares, okay, so two squares and five bars. How else could we explain this visually using these different shapes? Is there enough of anything to combine to a larger value? And if not, then we might need to take something and break it down into a smaller value. Alex, you have a question or an answer? 
answer. Okay. What do you think, how else can we express this? Well, what you could do is since, is since um, if you were to have like, I think a stack, like, if you were to have at least a hundred of the, of the thousands, um, you could, you would be able to trade, you'd be able to trade um, the thousands for hundreds, but since you can't do that, you would have to convert the two S into thousands. So you'd have two thousand. So each one of these hundreds is worth 10 of the lower value thousands. So I could, instead of having a one square, I could have 10 bars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I replace this with its equivalent value here. I take this bar, I have 10 more bars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I can't condense that at all because that is what it is. So then I could just have, move these down here. So I could have two squares and five bars or 25 bars because each bar is worth a thousand. So I have, 25 thousands, two in the hundredths, five in the thousands means the same thing. So this is expressing this amount, but just breaking these larger values into their equivalent smaller values. Okay, so these can be handy. It's kind of like when we've done the, um, the, the set models, where when I, I've got all these things, how can I group it? If I, had, if I had started out with all of these bars, how could I simplify it? Well, every 10 means one whole, 10 means one whole. So I can have two and a half of those type of things, okay? So let's, I wanna keep those. So if we look at number three, it says uh, for each number, draw or describe two different diagrams that represent it. So if we have point 0.1, that is one tenth, what is, what are two ways I can represent that physically using these symbols? Alex, give me one way. Okay, so since you have point 0.1, that's equal to, that's essentially one-tenth. Which is represented by one rectangle. Yeah, so using one rectangle is one way of showing one-tenth. Does somebody else have another way I can express this exact same amount using a different symbol? Brandon. Uh, you could do 10 of the squares. 10 of the squares, yes. So one rectangle or 10 squares. Well, I, actually, I don't want to do dots because those are 10,000, so I was trying to be lazy. And my squares get sloppier as I go, yes. Okay, all right, yes, these two are equivalent representations of one tenth. How would you do two hundredths? Uh, Alex and Brandon have both just answered for the last one. So I wanna hear from somebody else because I need to know what you guys know or don't know. How do I stop raising my hand? Hold on. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> I'll do fishy face at you. Hmm. Tim says two boxes. Yes, two boxes. Okay, or we can just go two squares. How else can we express two hundredths? Okay, that is, that's fine. The person who just missed. Tanner says 20 lines, so 20 bars, 20 
bars also works because every 10 bars represents one of these. So two squares or 20 bars, fantastic. Okay, and how about four thousandths? I believe that was, yes, thousandths. Nobody? Um, okay, 10 dots would get us part of the way there. So 10 dots is 10, 10 thousandths, which is one thousandths. But how many do I have? I have four of thousandths. So how many dots am I gonna need? If 10 dots represent one thousandths, I would need 40 dots, yes. We'll go 40 dots because every 10 dots equals one bar or one thousandths. Okay, so then how else, in addition to 40 dots, can we express four thousandths? What symbol represents thousandths? Wouldn't it be four lines? Four lines, you got it. Four, I'm gonna go, I'm I'm making it a bar because I used already used L for large up here. But yeah, four of the bars, because each one of those or the lines is representing a thousand. So four of them represents four thousandths. Okay, so this having a manipulative of something physical here can help us figure out how much we have or how much we're trying to take away when we are adding and subtracting decimals. Okay. So I'm going to show you two ways to do this. Okay, so looking at question number four, number one, I have three tenths, no, three hundredths. Three hundredths plus five hundredths. Now, just because I get overwhelmed by too many extra zeros, I do not put the zeros in the front. You can, but they hold no value. They're not bumping anything to a place value. So I exclude them so I can just see more clearly what numbers I actually have. So I have three hundredths and five hundredths. So if I have three boxes and I'm adding to that five little boxes, do I have enough to combine them and make a whole rectangle? Well, no, I only have eight. So if I have eight hundredths, I have an eight in the hundredths location. So I just have that. Now, if we are solving this mathematically without diagrams involved, same rules of addition apply. But what is critical is that we are lining up our decimal places. I have two numbers, so that means I would need to have two decimal places. I didn't give myself enough room. All right, what do I have after it? Zero and three, zero and five. My tenths are lined up, my hundredths are lined up so that I can then add as normal from right to left. Three plus five is eight, zero plus zero is zero. And then I just drop my decimal down. So this is the most critical part of adding and subtracting decimals is your decimal places are lined up. Just like with whole numbers, we wouldn't add one one to 10 one tenths because they just don't correlate. They're different values, okay? So then if we have, now we're gonna go with six thousandths and seven thousandths. So six thousandths, plus seven thousandths. Well, if I have bars for that, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, and then I have seven more. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are all of the bars I have all together. Well, I know that 10 of these makes one, can combine to make one of the larger size. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. I'm going to separate that from the rest. I can now take these 10 and squash them down to make 
one square and three bars to go with that. So what is that? I have one in the hundredth spot and three in the thousandth spot. So I have 13 thousandths. Okay, we could also do this mathematically. I have two numbers, zero dot dot. I have a zero, zero, six, zero, zero, seven, making sure I've lined up all my place values. Six and seven is three. Carry the one of that because I have 13 thousandths. And then one plus zero plus zero is one, and zero, and decimal. So there we go. Okay, I would like you to. Uh, solve for me six. What is four tenths and seven tenths as a final answer? So if I have a three tenths and a five hundredths, I write them so that I line up the decimals and I have a three and I'm supposed to take away five hundredths. I cannot look at this and say, oh, I have nothing. So when I take away five, I have five. No, I can't take five away from nothing. I have to have something here. So when I have a value being asked to take, be taken from nothing, I need to plug in a zero. Now that I have zero, how many fives can I take out of it? Or how many, what do I have left over when I take five out? Well, I didn't have anything to start with. So I gotta borrow. I gotta actually get something to then subtract from. So I'm going to borrow a 10, leaving me with two here and break and add the one in front of that zero to now have 10 hundredths. That's why we can just plug in a one in front of whatever we have because we're adding 10 units of the smaller value. So now I have a 10. I can take away a five, leaving me with five. And now I have a two minus nothing leaves me with two. So it's okay if there's a zero on the bottom, but it's not okay if there's a zero on the top. So I have 25 hundredths. I can then double check. I did my subtraction, right? By taking my answer and adding to it what I took away. And if I did it right, then I get back to that original value. And that zero at the end held no value. So I just drop it to get the three tenths. So one of the things we need to do is practice really explaining what we are doing using proper terminology. If I have two and one tenth, and I'm supposed to take away four tenths, how am I going to do that? Well, I line up my decimal places, and then I'm supposed to subtract four tenths from one tenth. That is not enough. So I need to borrow one whole from the two, leaving me with one whole, and take that one whole and break it into ten tenths to add to the one tenth. Now I have 11 tenths that I can take four tenths away from, leaving me with seven tenths. And then I can drop the one whole down for a final difference of one and seven tenths. So we want you being very deliberate in the place values, the action that you're doing, the breaking apart, and um, adding to other values that you already had and, and just making it very clear cut that if I couldn't see this, that I could read the explanation and understand what you were doing. You can't just say, oh, I take one away from the two. I add one to the one. Wait, what? I can't follow that. I'm, I'm not adding a one to a one. I'm adding 10 tenths to the one tenth to have 11 tenths to take away four tenths from leaving me with seven tenths. So the more that we use the terminology, the easier it's going to be in being accurate. Because if we use the wrong place values, it's going to be very confusing to the person who's then trying to convert that into to a number. So that's why we need to practice. <laughs>